Hello, welcome back to the Southern Bible Thumper channel. For this upload, we will be reading Numbers chapter 27. I would like to share a good experience that I had at church. In April of 2022, I went to visit the river in Detroit with Pastor Marlon Reed. We've known him for some time. What stood out to me about his church were the women. This is a black church. They were black women. How quickly these black women embraced us. How easy it was to talk to them. How beautiful they looked. And it really was a nice experience getting to be around that. So I just really want to, when I remember these experiences, bring them up. The only reason why I don't go to that church is because, you know, it's, it's states away. I have to fly to get over there. And Detroit is extremely cold. Ooh, I get cold really, really easily. I cannot handle being it. It was freezing in April. Like, I have never experienced that before. Okay. Number 27. Then came the daughters of Zelophead, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these are the names of his daughters, Mala, Noah, and Hagla, and Milcah, and Tirzah. And they stood before Moses and before Eleazar the priest, and before the princes and all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, and he was not in the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin, and had no sons. Watch the name of our father be done away from among his family, because he hath no son. Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our father, and Moses bought their cause before the Lord. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, The daughters of Salafia speak right. Thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren, and thou shalt cause the inheritance of their father to pass unto them. And thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then he shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. And if he have no daughter, then he shall give his inheritance unto his brethren, and if he have no brethren, then he shall give his inheritance to his father's brethren. And if his father have no brethren, then he shall give his inheritance unto his kinsman that is next to him of his family. And he shall possess it, and it shall be unto the children of Israel a statute of judgment, as the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee up into this mount of Aram, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, Thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people, as Aaron thy brother is gathered. For you rebelled against my commandment in the desert of sin, and the strife of the congregation, to sanctify me at the water before their eyes. That is the water of Meribah and Kadesh in the wilderness of sin. And Moses spake unto the Lord, saying, I let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, set a man over the congregation, which may go out before them, and which may go in before them, and which may lead them out, and which may bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord be not a sheep which have no shepherd. And God said unto Moses, Take thee, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, and lay thine hand upon him, and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation, and give him a charge in their sight. And thou shalt put some of thine honor upon him, that all the congregation of the children of Israel may be obedient. And he shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word shall they go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and all the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. And Moses did as the Lord commanded him, and he took Joshua and set him before Eleazar the priest, and before all the congregation. And he laid his hands upon him and gave him a charge, as the Lord commanded, by the hand of Moses.
Okay. Summarizing Numbers 27. Five daughters of a deceased Israelite man named Zalafiad inquire about his inheritance. Traditionally, male relatives inherit property, but this family is all female. Moses asks God, who approves the five women inheriting their father's property. God also clarifies how inheritance should be passed down in special circumstances in verses 8 through 11. In verse 13, God tells Moses to view the land promised to Israel and that he will die for his disobedience in Numbers chapter 20. In verse 18, God tells Moses to anoint Joshua to lead Israel over Eleazar. Highlights. In Numbers chapter 26, verses 53 through 54, Moses is dividing land for inheritance. This is not the promised land. In verse 12, God tells Moses to view the land. That he's going to die when he sees it. Numbers chapter 25, verse 1, the Bible says that Israel is in a land called Shittim. And in 22, verse 1, the Israelites are in the plains of Moab. The next point. Church is responsible for property management. Church provides leadership to these previously enslaved people. So, so far, with, with this tabernacle, they've had uh, talent showcasing or talent development with Miriam. She's the first one that got to do praise and worship and dance. We have uh, churches responsible for medical. Uh, when we were dealing with leprosy in Leviticus and the, uh, the discharge, it was the priest who had to monitor the discharge. The priest is also performing rituals and upkeeping the sacrifices that God commanded. People who have previously been enslaved or in this example, the Israelites who are these previously enslaved people, they tend to lack structure and their only societal attachment is slavery. So when it comes to needing uh, medical facilities, counseling, anything, the church is it. Verses five through six, or five through eight. This chapter is addressing women and property. Even though inheritance is typically, ma typically managed by men, But God approves the situation. Also, what we should notice that God did not say is that these women should go ahead and get married. He didn't say that these women should go ahead and have children with the man that already got his inheritance. Marriage and pregnancy are not solutions for earthly gain. Also, man was not created to provide earthly things for people. <sighs> it's even hard for me to say. It is, because I don't, I don't like that. But the thing is, the earth was given to us for free. And if you lose everything right now, you can't get off the earth even if you want to. So the fact that we are being priced out of existence just about for resources that God gave us for free, it really made me think of that scripture, we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but principalities. When you look up the term principality, it means state, office, authority, territory, or jurisdiction of a prince. God gave us the earth for free. Now we have to pay. And the reason is because of some law, some principality, some unseen thing 
that is a structure, it's a structure barrier. Because even if you say like, I don't want to live on the system anymore. I just want to get some wood and, and build my own home. You're not even allowed to do that anymore. Also in Genesis chapter two, verse five, after man was created, his job was to work in nature. The next point, God smoothly tells Moses that he's gonna die once he's in the promised land. And he says that this is for Numbers chapter 20, when God asked him to speak to the rock and he beat it. He said, you're, you're gonna die too. And Moses' response in verses 15 through 16, Lord, please leave somebody to guide the Israelites because if you let me get gone, ain't going to be nobody. And God said, hey, don't worry about it. I already got someone, uh, Joshua. Go ahead and anoint him. And anoint him in front of the entire congregation so that they know that he's going to be next up. This is over Eleazar. Eleazar is Aaron's son. To put this into perspective, I'd like to rehash some information. Moses was a Hebrew. Moses and Aaron, they're Hebrews. But Moses was raised as an Egyptian. So even though he has Egyptian privileges, when he saw an Egyptian uh, mistreating a Hebrew, he killed the Egyptian he still feels some sort of loyalty to his people. So after that, he left. God tells him, hey, I want you to be the one to ask Pharaoh to let your people go. Moses goes, I can't do it. I don't, I don't speak right. And God says, okay, well, let's get your brother Aaron. He's better at talking than you. We'll have him do the talking. And um, Aaron did, he just complied because he wanted to help his brother and he wanted to honor God. But he gets there. Not only does he have to be going through all this stuff with, with Moses, but now that they're out, he's a priest. He has a job now. He has to wear this uniform with bells on it. He has to do all these ceremonies. And then two of his sons die. And then Moses just obeys again. And now Aaron dies. So now it's just Moses and Eleazar. Eleazar is Aaron's last remaining son who even outlived him. He's been faithful. He picked up the mantle and he went on into ministry with, you know, or rulership under Moses. And then he doesn't even get the promotion, the status to being what Joshua gets to be. And so it's just another example to illustrate. People don't always get things for the reason that you think they're, they get them. If we take time to just mind our business and just focus on ourselves, focus on what we're doing, that it won't come up how how unfair that feels, but this is pretty unfair that Eleazar lost his whole family behind Moses, and then he still doesn't get to be the anointed one to lead Israel. It's Joshua. Joshua hasn't put in any work the same way. Status on this earth is not earned all the time. Sometimes God bestows status on someone and sometimes they get, get it in a, in a different earthly way. Never be ashamed of yourself. Never beat yourself up. Always talk to God and always just thank God for what you want. Thank God my finances are taken care of. Thank you, God. Thank you. My health is where it needs to be. Thank you. Verse four is what really made me like, it was a big deal to me, okay? These women, they are worried about their father's name disappearing or being done away with. 
Why should we be done away with? Give me that possession. Having no property equals no economic participation, which is going to mean you're going to be done away with. It was just that simple. And these women went to Moses. When we realize how important economic participation is, we understand why God promised Israel their own land. Now, God gave them favor to fight these other groups of people, but not, it, not Egypt. Two things I like to point out about that. Egypt, that is their hometown. So God didn't have, didn't give them favor in somebody else's hometown. That's number one. Number two, Egypt did welcome Israel with open arms back when Joseph was still alive. And they helped the Hebrews avoid the famine. These previously enslaved people need individual, intentional, specialized compensation because without it, they will be permanent second class citizens. When we look at Exodus chapter 8, Exodus chapter 1, verse 8 through 10, Pharaoh feared Israel's capacity that they might join their enemies and subdue Egypt. When we look at Numbers 22, verses 3 through 4, King Balak feared Israel's capacity after watching them overtake the Amorites in chapter 21. And then after they defeated the Amorites, they lived in their city. This illustrates that institutionalized slavery is based in fear. It's rooted in fear. The society that embraces and benefits from slavery will remain one that thrives on manipulating access to resources. It begins to change the whole society into slavery. Outright and obvious slavery is not sustainable. It must be disguised and embellished to produce the illusion of fairness and the illusion of economic participation. Instead of outright controlling resources, the group in control will do things like offer employment or some sort of benefit for their service. Number one, this is usually not a good opportunity and it's easily lost or easily, easily revoked after having it being given. Number two, if the benefit is good, it only serves the agenda of the oppressor and it's probably still not that good. So two examples of this are Genesis chapter 39, Joseph was enslaved and then he was sold to Potiphar Joseph got fired for a lie. There was no investigation done. There was no, uh, there was no restitution made for that. His work history and his criminal history was just messed up with one lie. Then we look at Exodus chapter one. Pharaoh assigned two Hebrew midwives to kill Hebrew male children at birth. Also, the correlation between a previously, in, previously enslaved people and the idea that they should be, uh, they should be uh, getting rid of their children or causing their children to pass away, that's an idea. That's an idea that, that comes up. Will an oppressor class become moral and divide resources evenly? No, never. If, if two kings were afraid of Egypt and they had nothing, they would be even more vigilant about making sure they deprive them of anything else because they're already capable of nothing. If I give them something, surely they're gonna overtake me. 
And these people were so ruled by that fear that it was going to come back to them, which it's going to anyway. You can't take advantage of anyone. You can't just do whatever you want on earth. There's a spiritual consequence. When we look at Genesis chapter 43, Joseph is still in the, he's still playing the role of the Egyptians. And we see here that the Hebrews and the Egyptians were not supposed to be eating in the same area. It was considered an abomination. Exodus 1 is years later after this. We look at Exodus chapter 5. God even asked Pharaoh, can you let Israel worship for three days? This is after hundreds of years of being enslaved. Can we go worship for three days? And he says, no. No, you can't worship. Well, you can do his work for free. You better be glad you got that. Doing better than your ancestors. Why is this important? Genesis chapter 47 Egypt sold all of their possessions for seeds, dividing the famine, and they were required to pay a fifth back. This is after benefiting off of slavery. This was when, uh, this is before or after Joseph was enslaved, and now he's working for Pharaoh, and it was on him to take care of his family. But that's another thing about uh, previously enslaved people. When they get jobs like that and they find success, notice Joseph is the only one out of all 12 brothers that has success. All 12 of them are riding on this one man's back. That's why it's so ignorant when, you know, when those comments are made, oh, well, that one person got rich. It's easy for everyone to get rich. Well, that one person got rich. That's, that's evidence of equality because also the jobs that those previously enslaved people get, they further the agenda of people with all the resources. The thing about slavery is that it trickles down. Any law that is created by a society that benefited from slavery any law will have to support and nurture slavery in order to continue in its existence. Also, for, slave, for enslaving people, the land will suffer. The example of that is the plagues in Exodus. The reason why this chapter was so much, it was just so difficult for me to get through because Black people in this country have never had that history corrected. Never. And every time someone even mentions, hey, can we start this discussion again? It's met with hatred and hostility as if nothing needs to be corrected about that history. And you even have other Black people who will do it. Being a bootlick is not going to get you any respect. No one respects a traitor because the, the thought process behind that is if you will do that when you're unhappy with them, what's going, what you're going to do when you're unhappy with us? Well, it was just hard for me to get this out because of that I talk to God about that a lot and about how, well, I guess not a lot, but when things make me feel like that, when I'm reminded of how slavery and Jim Crow, and that never got healed. I have grandparents that grew up in Jim Crow. My grandmother's sister, the family that she worked for, their daughter went to school with me. I remember being taught American history when I was eight, not world history. This started long before America. 
when I was a baby being taught about slavery and then not even being taught the whole story. You still got to do your research to find out about how atrocious and psychotic it actually was. It's so much worse than you think. It's so much worse than you think. To think that these people just deserve nothing. Just deal with your history. And when I look at the statistics on wealth wealth distribution, I understand everyone else is suffering, but we can't think of you right now. We got affirmative action, which was a sliver. And then every other person that could be considered a minority was also included. I think I'm just ranting at this point because I just, I want to. Okay. Well, that was Jen, uh, number chapter 27. Thank you for watching. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Have a good day.